you just watch around. There are two new facts that were ushered in by these three great revolutions that he wants to uh, persuade us to be aware of so that we can change our lives. Um, and he claims that Marx uh, gave us these two facts, new facts, these Marxian facts that we're not aware of. Uh, the first, I'm repeating what I said to get it in your heads from last time. The first is there's a new, no new notion of causation. The second one, <clears throat> there's an aspect that occurs in society we're not aware of, which is that of class. So the first one, the first one, he says, uh, this is in part two, you're reading. He says, there's a new way of looking uh, at causation, of how, things, of how things in life are caused. And it's sometimes called in Marxism dialectical materialism or just the dialectic. You're not uh, you're in the, uh, David Amber. No, anybody, David, come in. Uh, there's a new theory of causation, okay, sometimes called the dialectics, dialectical materialism. And uh, let me just comment on that okay, for a moment. He writes there, and it's very poignant what he's writing here, very interesting and fascinating. He says, look, uh, Marx came up with a new way of conceiving of how things occur in the world. And the new way is that everything is both a cause and an effect. He says, things only occur in relationship to one another. They never occur alone. What, what he means is that they never occur alone is that there are no ultimate causes. Everything is an effect of something else. Hence, it can never occur alone. If it occurs alone, it's an ultimate cause and not an effect. He says that's not possible. Okay? All we have in the world is our complexity of causes and effects, things in, related to one another. I like to use the expression mutual causation. Things only exist in relationship to other things. They cause each other. And the second one, he says, that Marx gave us is a new part of life called exploitation. The name that capitalists receive from workers, unpaid labor. And that's kind of a horrible, I mean, he doesn't say this, but I'm going to say it, social theft which occurs. If you put the two ideas together, Okay? You would say, okay, let's see now, we have something occurring in life that Marx claims is there, that Engels is picking up, and the socialists thereafter are going to talk about class exploitation. I'm going to explain to you again on the blackboard today, class exploitation. If that's occurring, and if you also embrace the dialectic, that says, <coughs> two ideas together, that class exploitation must be connected to a whole bunch of causes. And class exploitation, in turn, is a cause of all those other things. So, for example, a market society is one amongst many causes of class exploitation. That's the dialectic, the first one. And class exploitation, in turn, affects how markets behave. To jump to the present. You would say that the current economic recession in the United States, from a Marxist perspective, one of the causes is class exploitation. No one says that. You'd never hear that on the TV. You'd never hear President Obama say that. But that you get out of discourse from Engels. And that's from the dialectic. That's the importance of it. That's the consequence. So a market structure helps to, a competitive market structure helps to cause class exploitation. That's not the only cause, there's a whole bunch. But in turn, the class exploitation complexly shapes the very market structure which is shaping class exploitation. That's the importance of this notion of causation. Okay. So those are the two points, which you're going to come back to again and again, but you still get it in your heads. Okay. Then Marx 
I'm sorry, then Engels begins to provide his uh, theory of capitalism. So in, in this next section here, in part three, it's finished with part two, in part three, which I can do today, part two presents these two ideas that I just gave you. Part three begins to present his theory of society. And in this part three, in this history, he's going to argue again, an idea that we talked about, which is that I'm going to start by talking about the economy, and I'm going to show you how the economy causes everything. That's why he begins with the economy. So let me do now this, put this on the blackboard, what he's doing here before I actually do the history. Engels has an image in his head, and the, and the Marxists after him had as well, including right up to the present. It's an image, metaphor, whatever you want to call it. And the image is a society is like a house. You can think of it that way. This is the metaphor. And a house has two parts. It has a basement upon which sits the rest of the house. Okay? So even in, you know, uh, in Arizona, which they don't have basements, you have to put a slab on the ground upon which you put your house. So you always you start from the bottom, and you put down the basement in New England, the cement slab, you build the house. You don't hang the house from a cloud. You start from the ground up. For Mr. Engels, this basement is the foundation. And it is called, in the Marxian tradition, the mode of production. It's economics. Upon which sits everything else in society. So everything else in society is called the superstructure. What is that? Well, it's politics. <coughs> Culture of the name, two big things. And the theorization that he's providing here is that the economy, let me actually take away economics here, oh, let me, the economics determines what goes on in politics and culture. So, uh, <coughs> the music that you like is determined by economics. Sometimes you'll hear this expression in American society, uh, the bottom line. What's the bottom line for some, oh, it's the economy, dollars. It's a profit motive. <coughs> economics determines it. You really want to know what's going on, why a person signs a contract, play for the Patriots, whatever, money. Logan Menkins will not sign a contract because he doesn't get the money that he wants to get. So it's, uh, he's a place for patrons. So <laughs> the economy, the mode of production, determines everything that's going on. The music, the theories, the theories, everything. The theories are in the culture. The laws and rules are here. It's a very powerful idea. And it's called in the tradition, and Engels is in this tradition, economic determinism. And Engels is an economic determinist. So let's use what we just said in terms of what we said before. An underdeveloped mode of production, an underdeveloped capitalism, yields an underdeveloped socialist theory. This is critique of the utopians. A full development of the base, the mode of production, enables a, causes a full development of socialist theory, that's his Marxism. So an underdeveloped base, an underdeveloped capitalism, produces an underdeveloped theory. Notice the causation. The causation is going from the economy to everything else, to the theory. That's why the utopians had an underdeveloped theory, because they came out of a economy that was, what, not a, not a fully developed capitalism. Since they couldn't have the ideas of capitalism, since they didn't live in capitalism. It took 
the development of capitalism to, to yield, to, prove, to produce the cause, the ideas appropriate to that full development of capitalism. The mode of production is comprised of two things. The mo two things. One, the relations of production. And the second, the forces of production. So first one, relations of production. Second one, forces of production. The relations of production have to do with the ownership of the means of production. Tools, factories, and so forth. The relations of production have to do with technology. So the first one is, who owns what in society? The second one is, how we produce what in society with those own tools. So this is the how we produce, this is who owns what. Got it? They want to understand economic cause, economic determinants, economic causation, art, music, politics, election of presidents, and everything is ultimately determined. The bottom line is what's going on in the economy. Questions on that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so his whole theory, though, is like that there is no one ultimate causation, so how can you say economics is the ultimate causation of everything? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh. Oh, it, oh, my God. It's the worst moment for a professor. So the moment, where are you, man? The moment Engels, almost the moment that Engels did this, somebody writes him a letter, you, and says, Engels, how can you do what you just did? You just said, you just argued that everything is both cause and effect, and now you just presented a theory of society in which there's an ultimate cause. You fool, you just violated your <coughs> premise. And that question has haunted Marxism for 130 years. And there's a lot at stake with the answers, as I'm going to show you in this course. So he just made an argument, you can't have economic determinism, and then he contradicted it by embracing economic determinism. And that's, the, that's, that's been a conflict for many, many decades. And sometimes in history, if you embrace what Engels did here, and if you raise your question, say, hey, you know, I think there's a problem here, depending upon the time and place, you will be arrested and put in jail. That's the importance of his question. But Engels is a bright guy. So here is his initial answer. <coughs> he, say, he says, oh, in that letter, his answer to the guy, you're right. How could Marx and I ever deny that politics and culture don't affect economics? And the history of the world shows that. Obviously, the religions affect the economy. How we think affects the economy. Our laws affect the economy. I mean, Jesus, <coughs> but, but how they affect the economy is determined in the last instance by the economy. So he's, the people come back and say, look, this affects the relations and forces of production, and it affects the mode of production. So politics and culture, they together affect economics. But he comes back and says, yes, but the way they shape economics is determined by economics. And that's called the literature determination in the last instance by the economy. It's the, it's, it's the same answer in a more sophisticated way. So your critique holds. This was a big battle between the Russians, the Soviets, and the Chinese in the 1950s. They almost came to war over this theoretical issue. Stalin and Mao really fought over this. Stalin was an economic determinist, Mao was not. 
there's no minor matter in this. Okay, let's go back to Ms. Nichols, okay? And I want to now, so I told you about the causation, I told you about the class theory, I want to go back and do this history, but I want you to be aware of this critique of Mr. Engels and attention of what he's doing. His theory of capitalism. So he starts with the base. He thinks that's the, the most important thing going on. I don't, but he does. I, I want to teach you what he's saying. So he starts with the base, with the economy. And he starts with a society in which there's a whole bunch of independent producers. And these independent producers, which he calls if you remember correctly, petty producers, they own their own tools, that's petty meaning small, <coughs> French, petty producers, they own their own tools, they produce their, uh, their own products, which they also own, and they set in motion their own labor. So you can think of them, you know, like in early colonial history in the United States, these are the very, very small businesses, you know, the little shoemaker, the little farmer, and so forth. <coughs> Nowadays, it would be the plumber. Nobody works for the plumber. The plumber doesn't work for anybody. It's his own private business. The truck he owns the tools, and he does plumbing, which he sells to serve $800 an hour. No. So you can think of society as a mass of these, what I'm going to call ancients, these petty producers. I'm going to call them ancients because it harks back to ancient Greece and Rome, in which this kind of society existed and, of course, in colonial United States as well. And these ancients now, they own their own means of production. They're certainly using a technology to produce shoes. They own their own products. And his argument is that out of this ancient structure is going to come capitalism. And the way it emerges, the way capitalism, which is a different kind of economy from the ancient economy, is via competition. So, class exploitation, I'm sorry, capitalist class exploitation is going to emerge out of the fragmentation and destruction of the ancients. That's his history. You're going to end up, you start with a society in which everybody owns their means of production. And then you end up with a society in which it bifurcates into two groups. Those who own the means of production, a small group, and a large group of workers who don't own the means of production. That's the history. So in the United States, it takes about 250 years. We end up with very few people owning the means of production. They're concentrated, really, in the ownership of a few large 500 corporations, and everybody else goes to work for those who own the means of production. That's the, that's the history. Okay. Well, let me start then. I'll start with the relations of production. And Engels, that's in the mode of production. So this is the modes, relations of production. And the history, that's what this arrow is, this history, which I'll come back to, but I just want to show you what's at stake here. The history here yields two groups. One, those who own means of production. Tools, factories, and so forth, those who do not. Now, not, mind you, when the ancients were here, they did, everybody owned, but they lost their ownership. Okay? I'll come back and I'll do it, but I just want to make sure we understand what's at stake. So we end up with two classes here those who own, those who don't own, because of the history which Engels describes. And what he's describing is this relations of production which occur, this property ownership. Those who own the means of production become 
buyers of labor power. Those who don't own become sellers of labor power. Which is what I start, which I, that's the last lecture before we have the snowstorm last week, uh, last Thursday. Notice the causations, we don't lose them. You're starting with relations of production where? In the mold. The most important aspect in his economic determinism, the base. This begets, this causes a bifurcation in society, two classes, those who own, those who don't own because of the history, which I'll come back to. I'll explain that, but I'll come back to it, just let's accept it for the moment. Those who own the means of production become, that's the causation, buyers of labor power. Why? People who own tools, factories, machines, why do they have to buy labor power? They don't. They have too much. They have so much. They need other people. Why do they need people? Because they can't do all the labor themselves. Okay, good. Okay, you can't produce this coat with just threaded machines. Maybe some science fiction. What you need are human beings as well. You need human beings to set in motion the thread, the cloth, and the machines. So the boss, they, they own. The means of the tools to make the coat, but in order to make the coat, they needed an additional economics resource, and the resource is labor. So they buy people's what? Labor power. Capacity, don't lose it now, capacity to labor. Don't call, do not call this labor, because that's not what it is. It's not labor, it's the capacity to labor. Why do people become sellers of their capacity to live? Why do people sell? Need money. Huh? Need money. Why do you need money? Okay, so the sellers of labor power okay, have no choice but to sell because otherwise they will die. So they have to sell their capacity for labor to the buyers to get a wage to go out and buy the things they need. Do they have any other choice? No. Not necessarily. Well, that's not quite accurate. In novels, in movies, they have another choice. They could be merchants? Yeah, they could become buyers of labor power. But assuming they can't, or merchants, or bankers, anything else. They can become... Huh? No, you never read Charles Dickens. You had to in high school. They can become thieves. They can become vagabonds. So when this is all emerging, those people who don't sell their labor power for whatever reason, maybe there's no jobs, what choice do they have other than become a thief? What you've done here? What you're trying to show is that thievery is correlated with the buying and selling of labor power, the wage labor market. It's not in the nature of human beings to become a thief or not to become a thief. This is a counterexample. This says that thievery and vagabondage is socially contrived. They might want to sell the labor power, but they can't. There's no jobs. No, not enough buyers. And hence, what choice do they have other than become a thief? Interesting. There's a lot at stake in this. Okay, let's go. So the sellers of labor power sell the labor power. What do they get? They get a wage. And Mr. Marx calls this a value of their labor power. They get a wage. Let's say they get uh, four bucks. Get my piece for myself. That's their wage. And what do they do with the wage again, sir? They go and buy things they need. They go out and buy things that they need. So. They take the value of their labor power, they go out and they buy goods and services. Who's producing the goods and services? Those who own means production. That's right. By the way, let's see, they give them four bucks, they go out and buy four dollars worth of goods and services. Suppose these people are producing five dollars worth of goods and services. Is that a problem? 
Let's do it again. Get the logic. Suppose you give wages of four bucks to a lot of your workers, and you're producing five dollars worth of goods and services. Is that a problem? Why is it a problem? Good. This is that you don't have any idea. Because this is the, the answer to that is the recession we now have in the United States. So now you can have an answer. That is, if the wages are not sufficient to purchase all the goods and services that are produced, we have a recession. I told you, there's a lot of stake in this. The demand for goods and services falls short of the supply of goods and services. And then something's got to give. So right into this, right away, all of a sudden, there's the possibility of a business cycle. No one's planning this. It's going to be in competitive markets. Okay, what's this up here? As I told you last time, okay, this over here, the buyers of labor power have given up four bucks. That's a loss. That's a loss to the buyers of labor power, those who own the means of production. They hire, they buy labor power to get labor, okay, but they have to give up four bucks. So they lose something. They got to take four bucks out of their pocket, they got to give it to the workers. Or wages. What do they get? Why should they do this? Thing? Okay. So Marx says, okay, what they get is the, as I told you last time, they get the actual labor performed. So what they get is the actual labor performed. By whom? By the workers. By the sellers of labor power. <clears throat> and Marx calls this thing up here, okay, because he invented it. So every, all inventors, they, they get these labels. They, I mean, you're, if you're going to invent something, you're going to make it your own. He calls this, this actual labor reform, he calls this the use value of labor power. That's the value in use to whom? To the buyer. So, the workers go to work, and they work so many hours, actual labor performed by the sellers of labor power. Suppose they work actual labor performed eight hours. Length of the workers, they work for eight hours. That's the use value of the labor power. Labor power is the capacity to work, and what the buyer gets is its actual use in production. Right? You, you need these little, everything is important. The actual labor performed by the seller of labor power, where? In production, in the factory. The wages are given to the workers, where? You give $4 to the sellers of labor power, $4 to the sellers, in the market. <coughs> Notice there's, there's two different uh, geographic locations here, two different spaces. You get the use value of labor power in production, you give up four bucks in the market. That was not the same. Why is this important? Because everybody is, is more or less aware of what the wages in society. You know, you see, okay, you're getting four bucks. People are aware of that, conscious of it. People are not conscious of what goes on here. So Marx is providing a theory which people are not aware of. They're not, they don't know this, what goes on in the factory. This is the bedroom of the capitalist. Something is occurring there in that place. And Marx is providing a theory which will enable you to see what is occurring there. You can see this, but you don't see this. So, you get the actual labor performed by the seller, which is this eight hours, and the question is, giving up four bucks, what does the eight hours yield in value? So you're giving up four, what's your gain? So, what do we have? We have eight hours, that's what your buyer has got by buying the labor power, and the question is, times, what does it yield? Suppose it were the case, and this is an assumption, Suppose the eight hours times whatever it is yields, say, uh, what is it, eight dollars. 
So this is the value added by the worker in with production. <coughs> this is the value given up by the buyer of labor power where in the market. And this number right over here then would be one dollar over one hour. Right? One times eight minus one. So every single hour the worker yields a dollar. So this I'm sorry, one hour. So every single hour the worker yields a buck. This is called by Marx, this thing right here, the intensity of labor. Ah, the intensity of labor. And the intensity is such that <coughs> over the eight hour day, the worker yields eight dollars of new value. Well, look what you got here. This is not, you don't have to be genius to figure this out. Although it was a particularly, particularly uh, momentous moment for Marx, okay? I mean, because he figured it out. Let's see. The gain to whom? To the buyer is eight dollars. The loss is four bucks. Aha! There is a surplus value of twelve. At the origin of circle play. Ready? It's a test to see what we've got. Suppose the workers, just suppose, the workers say, hmm, we want eight dollars. And everything else stays the same. What will happen to the buyer of labor power? They won't make any money. <laughs> They won't make any money. They won't make any money. And that's what will happen to the buyer. They will go out of business. Can you be more dramatic? They won't hire them. Can you be more dramatic? <laughs> yes. They die. I like that. I always use that in every single one of my classes. So the buyer of labor power will die. So death has an economic root here. This is a real threat. The higher the wages, if nothing else changes, the higher the wages, the surplus value will become, you can see, this becomes eight, this is it. Suppose, you know what I'm going to do now, obviously. You ready? Suppose the wages, everything else stays the same, but suppose the wages become zero. What will happen to the workers? <coughs> they will die. And by the way, what will happen to the capitals? They'll die too. They'll die too. <laughs> Hence, if that's the case, what determines the wage between zero and eight bucks? Demand. Huh? Yeah. Demand. The no. Or the products? No, no, no. Well, yes. Uh, the labor market? Well, his marks and mistakes. What determines the wage between zero and eight is going to be a struggle between capital and labor, between buyers and sellers of labor. That's what determines the wage. The supply and demand schedules that you all learn shift all over the place because of the struggle between these two classes. Unions get formed for what purpose? Well, one purpose is to get a higher value of labor power. If you could break the union, you get a lower value of labor power. That's a struggle. Okay, you see the logic starting with the left hand side of your city. You go from left to right. That's the economic determinants. Now you're gonna, I'm going to give you a criticism of all this, but so I want you to get before we criticize it, get understand what it is. So the surplus value comes out of this property ownership, which is rooted in, in the mode of production. One last thing on this, okay? Any questions on this before I do the next, which is connected to this? Let me erase this. Stuff. Hmm. 
right? This is called a time line. Start with zero, and we're going to go for eight hours. So what I'm doing now, I'm redoing something with a kind of um, time line, kind of picture to get you to see the same line. Okay, you ready? Here are dollars, here are our hours. I'll carve it up now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight hours. The eight hour day. This is the length of the work. The length of the work. We'll call it H. The length of the work. Eight hours. Hours. What the work is produced per hour? I just gave it to you. What do they produce per hour? They go to work. <coughs> on the average, what do they do? Produce every single hour. <coughs> they produce one dollar <coughs> per hour. That's the intensity of labor. One. Two, three. Well, wait a second. So this is what is yielded by the workers. The use value of their labor power yields one dollar. After four hours, after four hours of work, the workers have yielded one, two, three, four dollars. What's that equal to? That's right. That's the value of their labor power. So after four hours of work, in this simple example, after four hours of work, the workers have produced sufficient wealth in value terms to cover their wages. Do the workers go home? No. no. The workers continue to work the rest of the workday, yielding another four dollars, but they don't get it. So Marx calls this unpaid labor equal to four dollars. That's exploitation. The workers, this is paid, but the workers continue to work four more hours, and hence, they don't get paid for it because they're paid. And they produce four more dollars. They produce, they add the value four more, which go to the bias of labor power. And Marx calls this part class exploitation. You can do the same thing each hour. It's just a different way since, you know, it's a nickel or five pennies. Let's do it a different way. A worker goes to work and produces a buck. After one hour, how much does the worker get paid per hour? 50 cents. Good for you. That is the value of labor power divided by the number of hours is four dollars divided by eight is eight hours is 50 cents. So the first hour, the worker produces a buck, gets paid 50 cents. So there's unpaid labor of a half a buck per hour. 50 times 8 is your $4 of surplus value. Each hour. So 50 cents per hour times the 8 hours is $4. That's just doing the same thing in a different way. So Marx claims then this is the source of class exploitation. People are producing an enormous amount of value, but only getting paid for a portion of that which they produce. That's the claim. Next, I'll finish this, then we've done all the steps necessary to go through people's argument. Next step. What about the machines and tools and raw materials required to produce coats? As we just said, it's not just labor power. You need you know, thread, machines, raw materials, blah, 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 to produce the weapon. Okay, so smart said that's absolutely correct. So let's 
examine that. He says, okay, suppose it were the case that an employer, producer of the coats, requires, let's say, eight dollars of machines and raw materials. You understand what I got? You got a quizzical look. Okay? Everyone understand this? So he calls this C. That's the cost, if you want, of all the capital required to produce coats. What I mean by that is the thread, the wool, the wool, all that stuff that goes into that. Machines, all that stuff. The non-labor inputs. Plus the value of labor power, wool box in my assumption, plus of course, whoops, the surplus, the profits, the profits of four bucks. And that's the total value, the total value, W, the total worth of the code, which is uh, $16. So the total value of a code or an automobile or whatever it is, a pharmaceutical drug, comprises then the materials, you want the means of production necessary to produce it, and that you use up in production of eight bucks, plus the wages you have to pay the workers of so four plus the profits. So that if you want the C plus V, you can call that the cost of production. Which in this case would be equal to 12 bucks. By the way, <coughs> suppose you're a coat maker, buyer of the power, you've got machines and so forth, etc. Where do you get the 12 bucks from? Suppose you don't have it. Suppose you don't have 12 dollars. You don't, you don't have it. But you want to be, you love to make coats. And you think there's a market, you can sell your coats. Where do you get the 12 bucks? I mean, how do you get it? So, here's finance. You go to another person that has 12 dollars, and he's five. Twelve dollars. You say to that person, "Hey, person, give me twelve dollars, because I got a great idea. I'm going to make coats, and I think I can sell them, make money. Give me twelve. And you, the banker, banks this, finances it, and gives twelve bucks. What does the banker get back? The banker gets back repayment of the loan plus interest. Where does the interest come from? The surplus. That's it. <laughs> That's the logic. Okay. So what we, what he just did for this, you can do it for the rest of it. So the capitalist has to come up with the 12 bucks, may borrow it from a bank, but then has to pay a portion of the $4 to whom? To the banker. Plus repayment of the loan. Suppose this is fantastic, it works. Everybody wants this coat, and you pay off. You get your 12 bucks from the bank, you're paying off, and so forth. You're hiring more workers. This is fantastic. You have to start out with, say, one worker. You, you know, next year you would have 580 workers. There's so many workers, you don't know what to do with them. You're bumping into one another. If they like these two guys, they'll be in the bathroom smoking cigarettes, not working. <clears throat> what might the capitalists do? Yes, did somebody up there? Where are you? Build a new factory. Build a new factory and you have a thousand in them. They're bumping into each other even more. They can't walk through a door. Can't, I mean, it's impossible. They're sleeping. They're arguing. What do you do? Get better machines. Get them out of there. Fire them. Fire them? No coats. That's not a good idea. You're going to be fired from the first job you get. Good answer. Reduce labor. That's the answer. So in, the, in history, the capitalists figure out what this guy just did. The first job he's going to get. They hire somebody to oversee these workers, to make them work efficiently and continue to work, and they don't go into the bathroom, and to work with the new machines and educate them, and they're called managers. And you, I've asked you, you have two weeks to read this article. Okay, so Engels talks about this. So in your reading, you've already read this. If you haven't read it, you could have something to do this weekend on Saturday. Nine. So Engels talks about managers and how the managers get paid on a roll. 
Yeah, where does the money come from to pay the managers? You got it. So in the first lecture, I started to do some of this for you. So the capitalist gets the unpaid labor, but the capitalist then has to take that four bucks and distribute it to the bankers in the form of interest to repay the loan, and to the managers, and to a whole bunch of other people as well. To what? To stay in business and be successful. Okay. Next. There's a question. I'm sorry. I cut somebody off. Okay. Sorry. Okay. You got this now? Okay. There are certain indices which are important for us, which we're going to have to establish now and use throughout the course. First one. What's the return to the buyer of labor power, so-called capitalist, the person who deploys and owns capital? What's the return? Well, this person is putting in $12 and getting out four. Okay, so let's get the ratio of the two. That's the ratio of what? Surplus value over the cost of production. And that's called, in the business world, the rate of profit. So the rate of profit here is a third. A hefty rate of profit. You put in 12, you get out four. Four over 12 is a third. Next. By, what's the rate of, uh, I don't know what to call it, what's the rate of exploitation? Let's do that. Well, let's see now. I know what exploitation is, that's surplus value. I know what the workers are getting paid. So the ratio of the two is four over four, that's one, or 100%. So what is that? That's unpaid, overpaid labor. <coughs> Third one. How important are machines in this production? How important are machines? Well, let's calculate that. Let's see. Machine. The importance of machines divided by the total cost of inputs. This is the total cost of inputs. Your material input, your labor input, is the ratio of the machines to the total cost. In this case, it's what is this? eight over twelve. So that's uh, <coughs> two thirds, sixty-seven percent. So these are the three famous indices. The profit rate, the rate of exploitation, the composition of capital. Composition of capital, that is how much of capital, what is the C proportion, the rate of exploitation, the rate of profit. You ready now? Because I'm going to put them all together in a formula, which we'll use for the rest of the course. And so I'm going to write here the rate of profit okay so I'm just going to manipulate this I'm going to divide the numerator and the denominator by what am I going to divide it by um, V. So I'm going to divide this by V, and I'm going to divide this by V. If I haven't done it, V over V is 1. So I'm going to rewrite this now as S over V, the rate of exploitation, V over C plus V. Then I'm going to rewrite Then I'm going to add C, and I'm going to subtract C from the numerator. You know, C minus C is zero. So here's my new writing. S, B, 1 minus C over C plus B. So the rate of profit is equal to these other two indices. The rate of exploitation, it's got a neat formula, and the composition of capital.
Suppose in a capitalist economy like the United States, suppose its industrial history is of a continual rise of the, the composition of capital. What does that mean? That is that over time, employers purchase you know, more and more factories, machines, tools, and so forth. So this rises over time. <coughs> That's the history of the United States. The history of just about every industrial capitalist country. What that's saying is machines are becoming more important in production. If that happens, and if there are no other changes, what will happen to the rate of profit? Think. This is high school. Yeah. Go ahead. Increase. Either? What will increase? Well, it's going to increase, decrease, or stay the same. So you've got three shots. The first one is wrong. Is <laughs> this get Yeah, man. You're subtracting a large number. You're subtracting a large number, and hence. <laughs> Why is that important? Why would I do that? I could care less about the business. I mean, you can do it tonight. Who cares? I do this. Why is this important? To angles and to you. Yeah. Does it seem like you decrease the, you're increasing more machines and your profits go down? Your, your profit rate. Your, pro oh. your profit rate goes down. <laughs> Get the arithmetic. Profit rate goes down. Why is that important? Who cares? Because the capitalists are going to try and do something to restore that rate of profit. Before they do something to restore it, what does it mean when it goes down? Means that they're You're being too sophisticated. Extracting less surplus value. I didn't say that. The rate of profit is falling. It means they pay the workers less. The what? Pay the workers less. That's an effect. What's the immediate impact on the economy? I think that the rate of profit is going to fall because it, it's so hard to to create the technology. That's not what I'm asking. Okay, so let's do it. I understand the technology is increasing. That's the rise in the organic the rise in the composition of capital. That's what you're not right asking. I said, what's the consequence of a falling rate of profit? If the consequence of a falling rate of profit is a recession and a depression. That's the consequence. That's what's at stake in the United States today. That's the Engels argument. That's the business cycle. That's what's at stake. That's why I'm doing this. That's part of his argument. And his solution is socialism. That's what's at stake. Well, let's examine that. The rate of profit is this. We just did that. That's all right. But the question is, what do the capitalists do with their profits? What do they do with it? They get the four bucks, but what do they do with their profits? Do they go to Las Vegas and gamble it away? No. Yeah, man. Okay, so one of the things they do is invest. What else do they do? Because I just did it for you, yeah? They just say it's all a subsumed plastic. Well, besides, that's sophisticated. They throw it back in the economy. Here's what we did. But there's a logic, and you, you're going to get the logic. They take a portion of it, they pay interest to the banks. They take a portion of it, they pay salaries and budgets to managers. So let's write it all on the blackboard. They take their surplus, and they give it as salaries and budgets to their managers, to oversee the corporation where the workers are working. They give abortion to research and development, R&D. That's the man, there are R&D managers. They come up with like new products, new technology. They give abortion as interest to the bank for those loans so they can expand. They give abortion as rents the landlords, right? Because they get 
you've got a building on, on a piece of land, the land is privately owned, private ownership of the means of production, and hence you've got to give a rent to the people who own the land. Anything else can you think of? They got the portion of the surplus to whom? Security. So, roughly 20, no, more than that. What is it? Is it 30%? You gotta give roughly, yeah? New investment? Yeah? Yes. That's correct. You gotta give, I can't remember the number, I think it's 0.33 or something like that. You give roughly a third of it as taxes to the state. And then, not finally, I just want to emphasize, they also make new investments. I'll make it high. New machines, new plant, new technology, uh, new machines, new plants, and so forth. So the capitalists receive unpaid labor, enumerated. And the minute they receive it, they have to pay their managers, R&D people, bankers, rents to, to the uh, uh, landlords, state its taxes, purchase new machines, merchants that buy their goods and resell them, Walmart. So Gillette pays a fee to Walmart to buy its products. The biggest retailer in the United States. The merchant gets a cut from Gillette for the race of players. Dividends to the owners of the means of production. The people who own the shares of stock in the company. Now, we got enough on the blackboard. Suppose, here's, the, here's our angles now, suppose there's an increase in C over, <coughs> mechanization, that's a wonderful thing. That's fantastic, it's more machines, higher productivity of labor, that's what capitalism is supposed to do. That's the history of the US and France and England and so forth. Suppose this causes a fall in R. That's the formula. And suppose, I'm gonna jump now, Suppose, I'm going to jump to this because you all studied this. Suppose that's falling. Whatever that happens to the left hand side, it happens to the right hand side. Suppose this falls. So, businesses start buying fewer investment goods, hiring fewer workers, because the future looks this way. What's going to be the impact? On the U.S. economy of a fall invest of a fall in investment. That's the question. Recession. Hmm? A recession. A recession. He says. I want to know the exact impact on national income from a fall in Y. Where are you? Yes, sir. Higher rate of exportation. No, that's not the answer. You learned that in this course. I mean, what you learned in your other courses. I want to know if this falls by. Say a hundred billion dollars. What's that going to? What's the quantitative impact on the U.S. economy? Yeah, man. Uh, GDP. By how much? Exactly. Uh, Not an exact number. What's the multiplier? That's the answer. So what you learned, and this is why I, you know these other courses can be important. What you learned in 104 and 204 is that this fall in investment of $100 billion has a multiplier effect on national income. And what you learned in those courses was that the change in national income times the multiplier, marginal propensity to consume, times the change in investment. If the, if the marginal propensity to consume is 0.9, then that change of $100 billion, because there's a change in the profit rate, is going to change this by $1 trillion. That's your recession in the United States, starting in 2008. That's it. There it is. So let's put it together. What Mr. Engels is explaining is the business side. He's saying, look, but look what he's done. Okay? Why it's such a powerful argument. And why it has to be suppressed so often because it's so dangerous. He's saying that capitalism, which has built into it this wonderful index of success, 
a rising composition of capital. That's what capitalists do. They purchase more machines, more technology. Fantastic. That's what they do. That causes an unexpected result. No one's got people aren't aware of it. It's an unexpected result, an unintended result, which is a fall of the rate of profit. That's the formula. And a fall of the rate of profit may cut all of these, and I just showed you, if it cuts investment, because the future looks dim, that has a multiple effect on the economy. It pushes the economy down, as you correctly said, by a multiple effect, that's called a recession. That's the business side. Okay. So that, I'm sorry, that's the downward part of the business cycle. Then you just run it in the opposite way for the, for the upturn. The only link then is, we have to ask then, okay, what causes this to occur? What's the cause of this which will cause this mess? And what Engels is going to argue is that the cause of this is, he's going to blow you away, Capitalist competition. And that's his idea. That which we celebrate in the United States, which is competition, has the potential to cause a disaster, which means no jobs when you graduate. Fortunately, we're getting out of the recession now, so you will have jobs when you graduate. But last year, it was really dismal. I felt terrible for the class. No jobs. Why? Because of, according to his argument, his theory of capitalism, the thing that we celebrate, capital, the market, that's what this is, capital, supply and demand. Market competition begets a rise in the composition of capital, and I'm going to show you this, a falling rate of profit, the possibility of a recession. Last step in this, I'll start. What should society do in the face of a recession? Yeah, man. So one answer is by this guy that we already talked about, John Maynard Keynes. The way to get out of this is to run a deficit. That's the current administration. Actually, the Repub first the Republican, then the Democrat. It's, it's now changing. So, from this perspective, the deficit is a good thing. <coughs> so that's one theory by Mr. Keynes, macroeconomics. What's the other one? Yes, sir. Yes, that's his deficit. That's to get the federal government to run a deficit. Sorry. Yeah, that. About the local markets right Absolutely. I always love when I used to teach 103, 104. You can sum this up with the gentleman just did. Do something, run a deficit, do nothing. And the market will self-correct. That's your two arguments. And it oscillates back and forth. The third way is Mr. Engels. Socialize the relations of production. So those are your three theories in economics. One is, do something! Have the state intervene to reform what? This craziness by running a deficit to get the people back employed. So, by how much? Well, if this falls by 100 billion, then state spending should increase by 100 billion. To offset what the private investors have done. Through no fault of their own, that's what the system is driving them to do. Because of the falling rate of profit. That's one. Number two, the conservative economists will say, don't do that. That'll make the, that situation worse. What you want to do is leave the system alone so the market will self-correct and boost up the profit rate. Let the inefficient businesses go under, go bankrupt, die. Let the unemployed labor cut their wages, and the market will make itself. They say fail, will correct itself, and we'll get back to full employment. Engels said, neither one of these solutions will work. Rather, we should change this craziness and socialize the private ownership of the means of production and control the market via plan. Those are your three theories in economics. And as far as that's it, so it's, it's three. And they struggle with each other and have been doing so for a long period of time.
Okay, we've got five minutes, so I got So I'm gonna go back to my story now with this in mind. Okay. We had these ancients. Okay, let's go back. You can think of the United States, our colonial history. We had all these petty producers, these ancients, owning their own tools and machines and so forth, etc. Okay. And what happens is that out of the ancients emerge a different mode of production called capitalism. We have an ancient mode, relations with forces. 